If you guys want to turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Luke in chapter 1 this morning. Uh, we are in the second week of this series. Again, the, the weary world rejoices. Last week we talked about this verse in the song, O Holy Night, um, in sin and error pining, and we talked about what that meant. This week we're going to actually get, in, get into um, the, the verse where it says, um, um, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And so um, we've based this, uh, this series again off of this song, O Holy Night. Anybody not heard that song before? Um, most of us have probably heard that song. If you haven't, um, it's a very famous Christmas song that, that we sing every year. Uh, for those of you who were not la- with us last week, I'll give you a recap of kind of the origin um, of that song. And uh, how it came about. So, how it came about. So, the, the song "O Holy Night" was the second song to ever be played on the airwaves on radio. And so, in 1906, there was the first ever radio broadcast, and "O Holy Night" was the second song to be pay- played on that on this broadcast. Uh, the song itself was uh, written in 1843 by a French man named Placide Capot. I'm going to try my best to pronounce French this morning. But this was in 1843. Um, originally, when he had written the song, it was a poem that was translated into a song, and, and the poem was actually titled Minuit Chaton, which actually meant uh, Midnight Christians. That was pretty good French, wasn't it? Minuit Chaton. That's, hey, that's two years of high school French coming at you right there, right? Um, and having to like listen online to get those words right over and over again. But this guy Capot was asked by a French priest in, uh, in 1843 to write the song. And the reason being was because uh, what, what the, the, this, this church at the time had had this organ, this old organ that they had that was being renovated. And in celebration of this organ being renovated, they wanted actually the organ to be played and it was going to be played on Christmas and they wanted a Christmas song to be sung. And so this church contracted out this guy, Placide Capot, to write this song for them so that it could be played at Christmas on their newly renovated organ. Do, do we have an organ we can play today? Anybody play organ? Yeah, okay, never mind. We don't have any uh, brass pipes or anything. But um, So they contracted him out to do the song. Well, little did they know that Placide, though a very well-known poet in France in the, the, mid-18th, uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, what they didn't know was that Placide was actually uh, an atheist. And so they contracted out this atheist to write the song. Well, what Placide did was he, the only thing he knew when they said, we want you to write a song that envelops the true meaning of Christmas. All he knew to do was actually go to the Bible and pick from the Bible in order to write the song. I mean, better than most Christians, right? It was like, um, well, I, I don't necessarily believe it, but I'm going to go to the Word of God and I'm going to write it from Scripture. And so he does that. Um, in 1855, another man takes a song and he translates it, uh, in, or takes this poem, he translates it uh, into this, this song. And, and eventually we end up, after several translations, with the English version of O Holy Night that we have today that played on the airwaves in 1906. So, it's one of the most sung and the most reproduced Christmas songs of all time. So over 150 years, this song has been sung millions of times. I mean, who hasn't heard that song? It's one of the most reproduced songs in history. And it's really ironic that, um, that, that what Christians love more than anything about this song is the richness of its theological content. I mean, if you read the, the lyrics to the song, it's actually quite enriching. It's really deep. It's amazing. I mean, as we were reading and preparing for this, this message series, we were just blown away at how deep these, these lyrics get. And, um, but, but yet the song was, again, was written by an atheist. It was translated by non-believers. I mean, the first time it was played on the airwaves, it was pray, played on a secular broadcast. And so, you know, all these non-Christians have their hands all over the song, but it's the Spirit of God that was actually moving in the lives of these people to help them write the music based on the Word of God. It's pretty awesome. It's, it's remarkable to me how the Holy Spirit could help pen the song that would encourage millions over its lifetime using an atheist, right? If he can use uh, a non-believer to do that, he could use any of us to do anything just by his Spirit. Um, what's what's uh, most intriguing to me, though, is that Capot, um, an atheist, when asked to write the song that, that captured the meaning of Christmas, even thought to go to the Word of God. Like, let's go to the origin of it all and actually derive the song from Scripture. 
So what a neat thing. Uh, before we get going this morning, I just want to pray for us. I want to ask that God be present uh, in this gathering this morning, that he be uh, moving in you guys' lives. I realize that this season that we're in brings a lot um, of joy, but it also brings a lot of heartache for many. And there's some of you that come here this morning that literally on your drive in, it was like everything in you was not wanting to be here. And there's like this wall that's been placed up around your heart. And I want to pray this morning that we all come here seeking Jesus for one reason, to seek Jesus. And we all come here this morning to engage with the living God. And that we come here this morning expecting him to humble us and to allow us to receive what he has for us. So would you pray with me? Jesus, I, I want to thank you for your church gathered in this room this morning. God, I thank you for each individual life. And I ask, God, as we open up your word and we talk this morning, that Jesus, you would do a crazy work in the hearts and the lives of, of those that are here this morning. I ask, God, that you would open up hearts. God, that you would humble us, that you would convict us if you need to. God, that you would reveal your son Jesus to us for who he is. God, as we enter in this season of Christmas, may we not enter into it for all the things that the world has to offer us in this season, but may we enter into the season truly recognizing the meaning of Christmas. Just like this atheist did in writing this song, he went to the Word of God to derive the true meaning of Christmas. And this morning, God, we want to do the same thing. We want to know, Jesus, what, what is the, the meaning of Christmas? What is hope? What is this thrill of hope that is talked about in the song? And I pray, God, that you would just do an amazing work in here this morning. And we pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. So it's been kind of cool to develop this, this series for us based on uh, the, this song because all of us have sung this song, right? Anybody not sung this song before? Um, most of us have, have sung this song at some point. I couldn't find any. Anytime I say something that sounds like Siri, my phone goes off. I'm really sorry for that, you know? Um, but we developed the series around this song, and um, it's like, I don't know if you guys have ever been in this place before, but you've sung something over and over again. Or even like it's on the radio and you're bouncing to it and you never actually realize what the meaning of the song is, what the words are that you're singing. And so often we gather in churches and we sing these Christmas carols and these traditional songs that we've sung for years maybe, but we never actually realize what the content in is um, in these songs. And for me, I've done that so often in my life. And as we've broken down the song, it's been really neat to see what it is we've been singing for years and break it down scripturally and understand like what what was actually intended by each verse that was written. Um, beings that we are living in this, this day and age where much of the world is weary. Would you guys all attest to that? We live in a fairly weary world, right? Not much different than the world that they lived in in 1843. Not much different than the world 2,000 years ago as Jesus came to us in, in, um, in, in human form. But we live in this, this weary world. And we discussed the fact last week that we're sinners, that we're people that are lost in our depravity, that we were born like without hope. And this is the problem that Jesus came to provide the solution for. How many of you guys know what the chamois is? You ever heard of the chamois? It's that orange cloth that's sold on a lot of infomercials. Now you guys understand what I'm saying. If you guys know anything about the, the origin of this, this product, the chamois, it's fairly crazy. The guy who made, invented the chamois, when he first released it, what he tried to do was just sell people a chamois. What he tried to do, like, I have this orange cloth, and this cloth will clean up anything, right? And so what he found was that he couldn't drive any sales by just telling people that he had this crazy orange cloth that was soft and it could clean up anything. What did he have to do in order to get people to understand the purpose for the chamois? He had to create mistakes that it could clean up so that people understood what the problem was and why the chamois provided a solution for that problem. So he began to like throw um, water and things on the floor and people would be like, oh, I've done that before. You know, well, have you done this? Have you ever spilt, you know, your soda all across? Yeah, I've done that. Have you ever spilt water all across? Oh my gosh, what are you going to do when you do, you know, these infomercial guys are just like the perfect manipulators, right? And so they, they throw something on the ground and then he'd throw a chamois on it and this chamois would absorb all of it. It would like suck all the liquid up into it. And, and then all of a sudden people were able to see, there's the problem. I can relate to that problem. And here's the solution that you're providing in us purchasing the chamois that actually fixes the problem. Now what's happened in the church, just to relate that to our faith a bit, um, I think as Christians, we're often afraid to present the problem to people. What we like to do is talk about Jesus. And Jesus is about grace and he's about forgiveness and salvation. All of these things are very, very true. 
But the forgiveness and the grace and the salvation of Jesus doesn't come without acknowledging the problem at first. The problem is we're sinful. We were born into a sinful world. Let's go back to Genesis 3, since the fall of man. We were born into the sinful world. We need a Savior. We need somebody to rescue us. And unfortunately, we, we don't like to talk about sin, so we just talk about the solution. But if you continue to talk about the solution without actually talking about the problem that the solution covers, like Jesus was God's like ultimate chamois that he sent to the world, right? So, so there's a problem, that there's sin. And for us as believers, for us to not relate to people and talk about what it is that Jesus has covered up in our lives, why did we need Jesus? Why was there a need for a Savior? Because my life was jacked up prior to knowing Jesus. And without him, I have nothing to stand on. But God has come in the form of this baby, Jesus, in order to provide this eternal solution for all of humanity. It's pretty amazing. But as the song goes, it says we aren't just in sin. It says that we're in error. And then it says, but humanity is pining. And sin and error, pining, we talked about last week. Like constantly looking for something better. Hoping to be saved. Hoping to be renewed. Hoping to be made right. But yet often trying to, to find that something better and the fix to their problem in everything else in this world except for the real solution that God sent for us in his son Jesus. The, the Bible, Paul says in, in the book of Romans that there is no one that is righteous, not even one. Now, that might sound like a really discouraging statement. There's no one that's righteous, not even one? No, there's not. Because righteousness only happens. We're only purified, cleansed, cleans. We're only forgiven. We're only saved through the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross for you and I. There's nobody that's born already fixed. We're born into this world immediately deteriorating away from the minute we breathe our first breath. But yet God's plan was never to leave man to himself to figure these things out on his own, but rather hoped that man would see how far off he was and see what Jesus did for him and find the solution in Christ. So Jesus became the hope of the world. Jesus became the world's only solution. And so today we're, we're actually going to spend our time focusing on this one line, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. Um, have any of you guys ever experienced a thrill in your life? Anybody? Like something that was just completely thrilling? Uh, one of you has. That's amazing. You know, I'm so glad that you, we have a bunch of risk takers in this room. Um, so will that one person just tell us like your one thrill that you've experienced? Uh, I want you guys to take one minute. I want you to turn to the people next to you and I want you guys to tell each other about like one thrill that you've experienced in your life and just take a minute and do so. Did you guys get it out? Does it feel good to get that out? Let people in on your darkest secrets. Next, I want you to talk about your three top sins. Turn to each other and just share them with one another. Um, so we, we talked about these thrills, right? How many of you guys realized in talking to that person next to you that you are sitting next to a crazy person this morning? Anybody? You're like, dude, you are freaking me out. Next week, I'll be sitting on that side of the room because I, I, don't, I don't even know who you are, right? So we've all had these times, these experiences in our life where there has been this thrill. Um, I've honestly um, had so many moments of, in my life that have been like this, but the, the, the dictionary's definition of this world, word thrill is defined as a sudden feeling of excitement or pleasure. Have you ever experienced that before? All of us have experienced that in some extent. Uh, one time, I was, uh, when I was growing up, I snowboarded a lot. So we're up at the mountain somewhere, and there's like eight or ten of us, and we decide to go out of bounds, right? I, I asked for forgiveness later, so you guys don't judge me for this, but um, that's where the most fun snowboarding happens, right? And so we went out of bounds on this, on this face, and uh, we're coming down this face, and all of a sudden the ground breaks from underneath us. 
we realized that the whole side of the mountain is like falling, like there was this, this avalanche. And, um, and we all freak out. And so all of us just point our noses down the hill and we just go for it. And I've never, my heart has never beat so fast in my life. I've never sensed anything like that before. But, you know, by the next run, it was all forgotten, right? It was just like, oh, that was sweet. You know, yeah, now let's go snowboard again. Um, or like a few years ago, I had done this amazing race called the Faster Pastor. Some of you guys remember this, right? It's this amazing race where they allow pastors to drive race cars on a racetrack. It's the most ridiculous experience ever. You know, who, it, crazy idea. Like, um, let a bunch of pastors get on a racetrack together who have never driven race cars and go 100 miles an hour and try to pass each other. It's just like insanity. And so uh, we, we, go, we go out there the first day to get trained to drive race cars, right? Because we're all professional race car drivers and, and we're ready to get in the seats of these stock cars. And they say to us, when you guys get in the car for the first time and that engine fires up, there's something that's going to come just like shooting through every vein in your body. You know, like it's going to be this thrill. And, and, and when you get out on the track and you start racing, like you're never going to experience a, an adrenaline rush in your life like you will when you get behind that wheel. I'm thinking to myself, um, just naive Chris, you know, like I've been in many experiences like this before. Like this isn't going to do anything for me. You know, like I'm just going to be driving a car around a track with a bunch of untrained race car drivers, right? Um, so we get out there on the track and we, we spend about two hours practicing out there. And the next day I get up. And I was sore as sore can be. Every muscle in my body hurt. It was like I ran an Ironman race. You know, it was like, I cannot believe from driving this, this stock car, I was so sore. But it's because every part of my body was just so tense and so fired up. There was just a thrill behind getting, uh, in getting behind the wheel of this race car and driving it at speeds that I'd never been before in a car with, like, so much horsepower that, like, my head was pinned to the back of the seat the whole time. You know, it was something... There was something about it. It's this thrill that many of us have experienced. And these were extremely thrilling experiences for me. However, what I realized after these experiences was that this thrill was very short-lived. So what happened two days after the race car, after I drove the race car? It was like back to life. The thrill of the race car didn't exist again. Why do you think people go back to racing race cars, right? to get the thrill again? Why do you think people go back up to the mountain, onto the face, to hope that they can get into that situation again? Because there was a thrill in it, and we're fixated on being people that can have these short-lived thrills in our life. Um, every thrill I've ever experienced in my life never came with the assurance that I'd make it out. Did yours? I mean, what's so thrilling about it? It's the fact that at any point in time, we could be toast. It's like life or death. It's sink or swim. It's like there's no promise of getting out of this thrill. Like I could lose everything if I don't make it out of the circumstance right now. And there's something that we're driven to um, when it comes to experiencing these thrills in our life. But none of these thrills for me were attached to any sort of a promise. And this is where um, the, the idea of hope becomes different than the idea of desire. Because desire is something that, that you wish for. It's something that you want. There's no promises attached to desire. But hope, hope on a biblical level, the, the definition of it is something that is promised to us in the future. Like we're attaching ourselves to hope because of the promises that come with hope. Not to sustain us and fulfill us now, but to sustain us and fill us for eternity. But sin in and of itself is a lot like this thrill. And, and most often the idea of a thrill is then attached to something negative or it's in conjunction with sin itself. It's a very short-lived experience. It seems as though it's going to fulfill us in the moment, but it leaves us wanting after we've already done it. Have you guys ever been there? You experience something amazing in your life, and you have this thrill, and then when it's done, you're left wanting, thinking that what you had was something that you really wanted, when what it was was something temporal that could not sustain you long term. There's no promises attached to the thrill of sin. Actually, there is one, complete destruction and deterioration of your heart, eternal separation from Jesus. But there's no promises of hope that are attached to the thrill of sin in our lives. This, um, this famous psychologist named Charles Snyder 
pioneered like modern, modern uh, psychology's concepts and definitions for this word hope. In fact, he helped pen this book that was called The Handbook for Hope that was published in the year 2000. But here is the definition that this guy Charles gives to the word hope. He says, hope is the sum of perceived capabilities to produce routes to desired goals along with the perceived motivation to use those routes. In other words, hope is the ability to imagine a future goal, to decide if it's valuable enough to, for us to actually pursue it, to figure out decisions we could make to move towards these goals that we have, to evaluate our past successes and our past failures in trying to achieve our goals and then perceive our motivation that we have to actually attain these goals and then decide uh, if we actually have it in us to reach out and grab them. So it sounds like a bunch of rhetoric, doesn't it? But he actually has enough data in his studies to back up his findings in this definition. That there's a humanly hope that exists and it actually tends to work for people. What he found was that, uh, that the high hope individuals experience fewer injuries in their life that higher hope individuals have a lower rate of depression. What he found was that higher hope individuals have higher goals in their life. So there actually was proof behind some of these studies that he did. But what the studies don't show is that this is humanly hope. It, it, it's a hope in ourselves, trusting that we can make things happen our, by, by past circumstances and all been involved in, that if I can do this, if I've done it before and I have the drive to do it again, that I can actually make things happen and I can achieve my goals myself. It's a dependency on ourselves as individuals to make things happen on our own. And, and, and what people who are massively successful find when they've achieved all they've set out to do is what? In the end, that they're worse off than when they're started. And if you've never hung out with those people, they're all over the place. I've met them my whole life. People that have had everything, have had millions and millions of dollars, the best careers, the most fame and fortune that they could ever have. And then you're sitting there talking to them, and they're like, but it all is worth nothing because I feel hopeless. And you're going, but everything you ever wanted in life, you have. But everything they ever wanted in life was something that was temporal. It was the thrill that they were after, but not a thrill that would sustain them long term. So they build these massive empires for themselves, these kingdoms. They've accomplished everything that they ever wanted in life, only to find themselves hopeless in the end. And for true hope to actually exist, think about this. What has to exist, what has to be present in, for, in order for there to be true hope? Hopelessness. You can't latch on to hope unless you've been at a point in your life where you were completely hopeless. Because it's in our hopelessness that we realize our need for something more. That nothing else, nothing we've latched onto in this world has worked, and I feel hopeless and down and out like I'm not going to make it another day. Because there's something in your heart that is longing for something greater that you were called to long for. It's Jesus that's reaching for you. He's coming after you. It's eternal hope that is only found in Christ. And it's our void of hope that actually gives us a desire for more. It's really interesting. So what many are finding is that the, the more they attain the hope that's offered to them in this world, that they can reach out and grab on their own, that they can attain themselves, the more they're left actually wanting something more because the hope in this world actually wears off. And this thrill of hope, as the song suggests, is this hope in something permanent, a promise that cannot be broken, a hope for something that we cannot on our own attain, but something that was actually made available to you. Jesus, as we talk about Emmanuel, this God with us. In Luke chapter 1, if you guys want to turn with me there, we're going to start at verse 5. We're going to read this story about this guy um, na named Zacharias. And, and he was this priest that was married to a woman named Elizabeth. And many of you have probably read this story. But the word says that they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. That they had done everything right. They had attained everything that they were supposed to do. Pretty amazing. Like they, they were doing everything they should. This was like the model couple, right? It says in verse 5, 
In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. It goes on to say in verse 6, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. But, verse 7, they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in their years. So the word says, they're righteous. Uh, in the sight of God, walking blamelessly, like pretty amazing. But then verse 7 says, but even though they're walking righteous, even though they're doing all the right things, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were getting old. They, they were blameless, yet they were barren. They did everything they should, but they still experienced hardship. Have you ever been there before? Where you've thought in your life, I've done everything you've asked me to do, God. But yet I find myself in the midst of hardship. And you're fighting with God going, that can't be. Because what we've been raised up in is generations of church that will tell you if you do all the right things, you won't face any hardship in your life. And none of that is found in Scripture. None of it. So what happens? Like, you follow Jesus. You give your life to him wholly. And then something shakes down in your life. And what do you start doing? Telling God how far off he is. God, what the heck are you doing to me? I've done all the right things. I must have to pray more. I must have to read the Bible more. There's something that I'm not doing right, and so I need to start doing all the right things. So then we start to do all the right things to try to earn our way with God, not realizing that just because you're doing the right things does not mean that hardship won't exist in your life. So we don't do the right things in order to protect ourselves from hardship. I hope you guys know that. That's not why we're obedient. The purpose, the purpose of obedience is not to buy yourself a happy life. That was never the intention of obedience. In fact, obedience, for those of you who have been there, done that, you know that obedience costs you more, doesn't it? Obedience actually costs all of us. And it's painful to live into at times. And it provides a thrill like nothing you've ever experienced before. But, but the reason obedience to Jesus is thrilling is not because of the rush. I'm not obedient to Jesus so I can get a fix like I do with everything else in this world. Like, just give me a quick fix, God. Like, I just, I need a hit of Jesus real quick. You know what I mean? Like, come on, God. Like, just give me, just give me through this next 24 hours. We don't go to Jesus. We're not obedient to what he's asked us to do in order to get a quick fix from Jesus. But we're obedient because obedience is a front row seat to God's faithfulness. When we're obedient, we get to sit there and watch God do his thing. We get to stand in the midst of the storm and watch Jesus work. We get to stand up and proclaim our faithfulness, our worship, and our honor to the creator of the universe in the midst of times in our life when everybody else around you is telling you to bag it and go home. And we don't. So we see this couple that, that even despite their hardship and inability to have children, they remain obedient and faithful to the call that God had on their life. Do you ever think that Zacharias and Elizabeth wanted to bail and bounce? Do you ever think they hit those days? It's just like, not worth it. I'm done. For sure, they had to have had those days. Did they ever actually bail? No. It says they remained faithful. Like they, they did. They were righteous in the sight of God. They walked blamelessly, did all the right things. So back to the story, like they're, they're barren and old, which means not only uh, have they never had kids, but you would get the idea from this passage that they probably never will because they're old. So pick it up at verse 8. Read with me. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense burning. So he goes in to meet with God, and they're all standing outside praying for this experience. Like they're praying that, 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 that he would engage God. And, and this angel of the Lord appears to him and stands to the right of the altar, the altar of incense. But... Uh, to, to the outside, uh, yeah, yeah, sounds to the right of the altar of incense. Verse 12, Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. Anybody else be troubled if you see an angel standing there with you? I mean, it'd be a bit, a bit like, you kidding me? Like, what the heck is going on in here, right? But the angel says to him, don't be afraid, Zacharias. How many of you be like, uh, that's impossible. <laughs> 
Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. This is John the Baptist. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth. Listen to the hope and the promises wrapped up in this verse. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, before Jesus, before the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Pretty amazing call. Zacharias says to the angel, how will I know this is for certain? (laughs) Uh, I'm an angel standing here before you. Uh. For I'm an old man, and my wife is, ad- is, ad- is advanced in years. How many of you guys know you don't call your wives old, right? He says, for I'm an old man, she's just advanced in her years. She's not old. <laughs> this isn't an old lady. The angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Like, you want to know how this is legit? I'm Gabriel, an angel from the Lord who stands in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple, but when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them, and he remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he, when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. So here's Zacharias exhibiting amazingly worldly hope, right? Based on his accomplishments, his obedience, like his, his assessments of what was possible, what was impossible, based on Charles Snyder's uh, little study that he did. Um, how, how likely would he be of like meeting this goal that he wanted to achieve based on Charles's study? Impossible. Based on everything going on around him and the circumstances, There's no possible way for him to actually experience hope in this. So what does he do? He doubts and he dismisses it. The angel says, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. So when Zacharias says, um, help me make no, like help me know that this was certain. Help me know that this is God. Like, will you just show me something else? You know, like the, you standing here is not good enough. Um, you know, like you telling me that you're an angel, that's just not good enough. Like, just show me something else. Have you ever been there in your life, where you're in the midst of something, God is calling you to something, and you're standing there going, "Show me one more sign, Lord." And then He shows you a sign. And then what do you do? You go like, "That's pretty good." Show me another sign, Lord. And then. You know, it's like, oh, that was pretty good. And then you're like, third time's the charm, God. You know, the number three is perfect. Come on, let's, let's just do one more sign. And God's going like, do you trust me or don't you trust me? Will you be obedient to what I've asked of you or won't you? And Zacharias doubts at first. And so what happens? Like, he's mute. He's not able to speak. Verse 20, it says, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled when? In their own time, on God's time. Last week we had talked about sin and our depravity, and we talked about this idea of pining, like the idea that there's something better than man's hope. Like we're always reaching. People are always trying to grab something that's going to uh, satiate them. But a hope that, that is in something much larger than us is what we actually want. That a hope that we can't attain on our own abilities or, or through our own success. A hope in something that lasts longer than this life that you get, this blip you get here on this earth. A hope in something more than the Seahawks making it to the Super Bowl, right? That's not true hope. Uh, maybe for some of us it is, right? but we want to hope in something greater than enough money to accomplish everything I've ever wanted to accomplish. 
We want a hope more solid and long-lasting than your career and the empire that you established for yourself here on this earth. A hope that, that causes the weary world to rejoice. A, a hope you choose versus a hope you wait to just come to you. Up until this point where, where Zacharias hits the scene in, in this first chapter of Luke, God had been quiet and did not speak to the Jewish people for over 400 years. God goes silent for 400 years. These priests continue to go into the temple to meet with God and nothing for 400 years. I mean, gener we're talking generations on generations that did not know what it was to actually meet with God when their ancestors had had the opportunity to do that, and everybody after this time would have the opportunity to do that again in a whole new way. So for 400 years, God goes silent. And so, again, priests like Zacharias have been going in and out of the temple, doing their duties, hoping to hear from God, but to no avail. In fact, in the midst of the silence, the nation becomes blinded and deafened to the point where most of the Jews could not even consider the concept of this humble Messiah. They couldn't even recognize Jesus when he came. They'd lost all hope because God was actually not with them. They had to make things happen on their own for 400 years. But then Zacharias has this experience. Imagine this. 400 years, ancestors on ancestors ago, they'd experienced God in a different way. But for 400 years, we've just been doing our duties and doing our thing to no avail. We haven't actually like, met with God. We haven't experienced him like his spirit was gone. And so he goes into the temple and he encounters God. Now, imagine this, after 400 years of nothing, now there's not only something, but the something is actually an angel of the Lord standing before him. And, and this angel begins to give him something to hope for, something, a promise to hold on to. He says, you're going to have the son, a son that's great in the sight of the Lord, a son that's filled with the Holy Spirit from within his mother's womb, a son who will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord, a son that will be a forerunner for the Messiah, meaning he's going to pave the way for Jesus. And this just isn't some small thing. This is God showing up and preparing the way for Jesus. This is Zechariah's son. Like, not only are they going to have a kid in their old age, but this kid is actually going to change the court, be a part of changing the course of history forever. Crazy. So he doubts, and God makes him mute, and then he comes out of the temple after having experienced God after 400 years of silence, and he can't say anything about it. He's trying to sign, like, imagine trying to sign, right? I don't even know how to tell you what just happened, like, angel, you know, and big, and I, I don't know, I don't even know what he was doing, but he's trying to sign them to tell him what just happened. He just had this amazing encounter with the Lord. And it's not until his son, John the Baptist, is born that his mouth is loosed and he begins to talk. And the first thing he does is what? He praises God with his lips. The minute his mouth is open, the first, I mean, some of us, if you've experienced hardship in your life, you've experienced a season like that, what's the first thing out of your lips? You, you know, like, I can't believe you did this to me. Like, I've worked so hard for you and this is what I get in return. God uses this period of months to develop in him this humility, to refocus his heart and his eyes on true hope. And when his mouth is loosed, he begins to praise God. This is true hope, church, that in the midst of what looks to be massive setbacks in your life, that there's this promise that goes way further than your setbacks. A promise way bigger, bigger than you can even see. So Zacharias responded to the promises of God. He believed. He worshipped. Like, how do you respond to the promises of God in your life today? Knowing them, how do you respond to them? Here's a few of them. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And who? Christ Jesus. How do you respond in your life to that promise? That's true hope. That's eternal. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while, we're, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Massive promises, quite the promise. How will you respond to this thrill of hope in this Christmas season, church? This thrill that's not temporal, a thrill that's pure, a, a, a thrill that's lasting. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Don't lose heart in doing what is good. You will reap in the long run if you don't grow weary. I, I heard, anybody ever heard of Keith Green before? I heard Keith Green preach this message. I, I, it wasn't live, okay? It was like an audio recording. He's passed away. And uh, so I heard this message that Keith Green preached. And uh, he, he's, uh, he's talking about this this, um, this church service that they did on a Sunday, and he invites all his friends, and like these people are all pumped because they brought in this teacher, and this guy just like blew him away, and like the Holy Spirit drops on this place, and guys are getting saved, and they're so encouraged by this meeting. So then Monday morning, Keith Green sits down with one of his best friends, and they're having coffee. And his friend's like, that was an amazing feeding time yesterday. That was just so rich. I mean, like what that guy imparted into us was so awesome. Like, What God did there yesterday was just so amazing. And Keith Green looks at him and he goes, yeah, but it's Monday. So what if you engage God yesterday? How did what God did yesterday impact your Monday through Saturday? It's so good. How is what God is doing in your life going to impact you when you leave this place? I mean, it's easy for us to come to a church service and just, like, experience Jesus. Maybe it's the only time in our week where some of us open up the Word of God and we read from it. And then you leave here and you feel like this thrill. But will that thrill that you have sustain you the Monday through Saturday, not just on Sundays? Will it carry you through the rest of the week. This last week as we were in our sermon group, Dan Stolbarger um, said to us, nobody can hold baby Jesus for us. You need to reach out and hold him for yourself. I thought, how amazing. Like, will you choose to pick up hope today and trust on the promises of God? Will you choose that this morning? Uh, Another man this morning came up to me and we were talking and he said, after all the dust settles, like in life and Christmas season, um, maybe you and I can get together for a cup of coffee. And as he's saying this, I'm going like, man, um, the dust is never going to settle. So let's have coffee in the midst of the dust. And will you choose to have coffee in the midst of the dust? Because a lot of you will make excuses when the dust settles in the new year. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to make different decisions going into next year. Next year will not be like this year. And so once the dust settles and everything's clear, I'm going to make new decisions in this next year. Well, you know what the rude awakening is? You might not make it to January 1st. So let's not wait for the dust to settle. Let's decide today to reach out and grab hope that Jesus has promised us. Let's not decide tomorrow to do it. Let's do it today. And let's be sustained by it forever, for eternity. Let's spend the rest of our lives and then eternity with Jesus. Not just try to get our fix of him today. The the hope of Christmas that that allows the worry, the, the weary world to rejoice is the fact that no matter what we're experiencing in our lives, God has promised us what? His presence. In the midst of the storm. In the midst of the dust. And for any of you that have been around for longer than maybe 15 years, how many of you know that the dust never stops flying? That every day there's an excuse as to why tomorrow should be the day that I'll start. And I hope that God is impressing on some of your hearts today to stop thinking about tomorrow and make a decision today that will affect tomorrow and the next day and the rest of your lives into eternity. God sent Jesus to us, his most treasured possession to us. God made a way for hope to be received, but you have to believe it. Will you believe that? And if you believe it, will you walk in it? Would you guys pray with me? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I pray for your church. God, as I realize there are hearts in this room that feel so far from you right now. God, there are people that feel so hopeless 
sitting in these chairs this morning, and yet you've offered them a gift to sustain them forever, that they don't need to reach out for all the things they think they need to try to get them by until tomorrow. But God, you've promised them something, a gift in your son Jesus, something that will sustain them for eternity, a hope that is attached to promises, a hope that, and an assurance of those promises that come with it, God, that, that you're not just offering us some false hope to get us by, but God, you're promising us an eternal hope God, that, that, that in, in eternal security, Lord, of where we're going to spend eternity, of the work you're going to do in our lives right now. Some of us have walked in that and experienced that, and even in the midst of the hardships in our lives, God, we're daily learning to lean on you and trust you and believe your promises, God, to have hope in you. But I pray for those in this room that don't have that this morning, and I ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would so come upon them right now God, that you would move in their hearts, that you would bring them to a point where they would acknowledge you as the only way, that they'd stop looking everywhere else, God, that they would acknowledge you as the only source of hope, the only one that can get them through, the only opportunity they have to have their junk cleaned up and to be set free and made new, the only opportunity they have to have their sins cast as far as the east is from the west. So I pray for those in this room, God, who feel right now just so condemned and guilty for all they've done, but I pray, Jesus, you remind them of the promises that you've given them, God, of the hope they would find in you, of the forgiveness offered to them, God, that they would now identify only with Jesus. We would stop identifying with our past and all that we've done and traditions and yada, 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 this is who I am, this is where I was born into, I can't get away from this, God, that you would wash those lies away and you would set our feet upon a rock. God, that you would give us a new plan, new purpose, a new heart, a new mind, new eyes to see the world as you see it, to see our lives as you see it, God, to see our future as you see it, for everything to be entangled in and woven in to your great love and your mercy and your forgiveness, God.